Coming to you from beautiful Studio A here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. Sprouted from the rooftop, it's episode 51 of the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Today we're going to get a little edgy. We're going to talk about garden edging, landscape edging. You know, a border separates two areas. An edge is a line at which a surface terminates. And how should you edge? There are philosophical differences. Should you use physical edging, like plastic or metal? Should you just use plants? Or should you use manual labor and cut a great line along the edge of your landscape with a shovel? These are all choices that we can make, but you know, edging can be as frustrating as hoses. And if you don't believe me, watch episode 40 of the Gardening Simplified show. And, you know, sometimes it can just get you really on edge. Like if you put an edge in and it's wavy, it just doesn't look right. Um, get you a little on edge, Stacy. You know, I am on edge because <laughs> I have an edging crisis you in do. my own garden. Yeah. And, you know, you just listed all of the possible solutions that I am aware of. And frankly, and this has nothing to do with you suggesting it, none of them are good. <laughs> it's not your fault. <laughs> and actually, I agree with you. <laughs> I agree with you. You know, they're either too much work yep. or too expensive or, you know, like my personal favorite, of course, is the metal edging. Some people call it Ryerson edging. I think that looks the nicest. It's the most permanent. But, you know, Lord help you if you go to kneel down in your garden and get your knee on that edge. Oh, that's the worst. What, or trip on it. Yep. Or something like that. Now, what I do is I get out a garden hose and I will lay out the bed perimeter with a garden hose, step back, look at it, get an idea of the shape I want. If I don't like it, I can pick up the hose, move it again until I've established that edge. But you're right, Stacy. then we've got to decide what are we going to do? And edging comes in plastic and wood and metal and terrace board and aluminum and brick and concrete and recycled rubber and rocks and stones and... I mean, the choices are just unreal. And yet one of the first things we notice in a landscape is the edge or the edging. Our eyes go right to it. It's what frames a landscape. And so the worst thing you could do, in my opinion, is put in cheap edging. Mm, well, no, I will say, yes, I agree. with. I don't disagree with you. But I will say that Black Diamond, so probably all of our listeners are familiar with Black Diamond, if, even if they don't know it by name, that's the black plastic edging with yes. a little rolled top, yep. um, is probably the least expensive. And it is actually very effective. It doesn't look great, but it does the job. It does the job, but I destroy it with my whipper snipper. With oh, my, you do? Yeah, with my, I mean, it just doesn't last long because I... Uh, I okay. I beat it up. But I, I guess the point here is if you do use the black diamond or you use aluminum or whatever physical type of edging you may use, um, do it right. Because it's like, you know, your landscape, it's like giving someone a gift, a really nice gift that you're excited about giving to that person, but not bothering to wrap it or put a nice bow on it. Or cheap paper, right? You want to wrap it up nice. I'm so. feeling personally called out by this edging conversation. <laughs> I mean, my current bed edging in my garden is uh, logs. So logs. My, yeah, so my friend, uh, you know, he lives out in the country and, and had a bunch of you know fallen trees, and his son has a firewood business. So we just asked him to cut like six foot lengths of logs. And it works, you know, sort of in a beachy kind of informal way. You know, my yeah. garden's mostly native. Um, and it works. But, you know, the, the important thing about edging, besides it looking really good, is it is one of the best ways to keep the darn grass out of your beds. Yes. And that is the bane of my existence is grass in the beds. That's true. It's frustrating. And the other great use of edging, in my opinion, is the fact that Homes have harsh architectural lines. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, they're straight angles or straight lines, vertical or horizontal. And so if you put in a curved bed, it really helps soften it. It brings it all together. It packages it really nicely. So with that in mind, here's my limb a rick for the week in regards to edging. I tend to be a plant hoarder, so I bought them a physical border. It will work. They are alleging this cheap roll of plastic edging 
dropped on my doorstep via mail order. A bargain offer when I logged on, bought with a discount coupon. The roll arrived permanently coiled. My edging plans are now foiled. I'll just let the plants invade my lawn. <laughs> you ever try to uncoil that stuff? Uh, yes, I, I used it during a COVID project. And uh, what we did is we had to leave it out in the sun for like 48 hours yes. with a rock on either end <laughs> and try to uncoil it and then put it in. Yeah. And it's already collapsing because it can't hold back the weight of the earth. It's not, uh, it's might be fine for some lightweight projects, but not, not heavy duty <laughs> sand, I guess. Well, and, and think about it. You know, I also see people trying to cut an edge or edge around a large tree that's in the yard. You try to work through those roots. It just doesn't work. Plus, you don't want mulch mounted up against the base of a tree. It's damaging to the tree. It's not good for the tree. So you're best to mulch lightly or have a ground cover grow up to the base uh, of the tree. I like these beds that have no physical edging. Uh, a shovel is used or one of those uh you know, round half moon edging tools, a square spade, and they cut a nice deep edge. And I think about Queen Elizabeth Park in Vancouver or Bouchart Gardens, or even here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. A couple of weeks ago, we did the uh, summer tour. And as I walk through those beds, they're just cut so nicely and deeply, and they're not using any plastic edging. No, you're right. Uh, a hand cut edge is a thing of beauty. Uh, and if you are into hand cutting your edges, then you will enjoy it. And if you are not, you most certainly <laughs> will find it to be a uh, a project that you don't particularly enjoy. I mean, it's it's dirty. You end up with quite a lot of stuff to yeah. discard at the end, you know, grass and stuff. Now, I do have a beautiful uh, vintage English half moon edger that okay. I really like. It was made in England, so high quality. Um it doesn't make the job any better. I mean, it is it is easier to use than a flat shovel, but um, it doesn't make me like the job anymore. Well, then let's just edge with plants and take our chances. <laughs> There's many great shrubs, of course, a low scape or groundhog aronia. I love double play candy corn spirea. Uh, you have uh, lo and behold microchip budlia. I have seen that used. My Monet wajila. Um, I found in hot spots nepeta. Or mm -hmm. sedums works really great. Proven Winners has rock and round, rock and grow, rock and low, yellow brick road. Oh, love all those plants. Short ornamental grasses like Festuca glauca. And then the herbs, parsley, golden oregano, or thyme, or sage all work. I've seen people use parsley. That sounds like a Sarm, uh, Simon and Garfunkel song from the 1960s. Yes, I'm dating myself. Uh, but are you going to Scarborough Fair? Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. You know, and on that same album, he had a song that said, so I'll continue to pretend my life will never end and flowers never bend with the rainfall. Paul Simon evidently never grew smooth arborescent <laughs> hydrangeas, right? No, I can't. And in the annual world, uh, lemon coral sedum is fabulous. Love that plant. It looks tough and prickly, but it's actually quite soft and pettable. Uh, coleus, your mom's favorite, we learned last week, like color blaze coleus, sweet Caroline potato vine, vista supertunias, snow princess lobularia, plectrantis. There are many great plants that make a great edge. Yeah, it's just, you know, you still got to worry about the grass. That's, yes. that's my edging challenge. But, you know, maybe other people don't have that problem. Do you have that problem? Oh, I have the problem. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, I have the problem. But that's why I'm saying sometimes edging can be as, uh, as frustrating yeah. as hoses. But, you know, we talk often about having diversity in the landscape and planting a diverse group of plants. Feel free to do that. That's fun. We talked about neighborly gardens last week or cottage gardens. But then if you pick one certain plant for the edge and plant that all along the edge, I like that look because it brings everything together. It's, it's like it's the final chapter of a book. It ties the whole thing together and now everything's neat and tidy. 
except for the grass that's popping up all over. Yeah, I agree. It's a nice way to get some cohesion. And once you have that edge established, whether you've done that with, you know, an actual physical edge or a plant or both, you can kind of get away with a lot more interesting stuff going on in the middle when you've established that sort of geometry. So I love it. Well, hopefully we've inspired you somewhat. We're living on the edge here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Plants on Trial is coming up next. Make sure to stay tuned to the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. I don't know if we have lived up to our name in our edging conversation. (laughs) (laughs) Good point, Stacey. Good point. (laughs) Um, I, you know... A lot of things, I feel like I give a lot of advice to gardeners, you know, through through the course of my days here working at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. And a lot of times I say to people, you know, hey, sorry, I know that's easier said than done because a lot of times we give advice that, mm-hmm. you know, is like very easy for us to say, but we know we're kind of giving the person who asked us quite a lot of work. And I think that that is true <laughs> with edging. So uh, whatever you decide, however frustrated you are, Know you're in good company, and if you're not frustrated, consider yourself lucky because the best thing that you can do in the garden is uh, enjoy the things that you have to do, like watering or weeding, at least one of those things. I I, I can tell you, Stacey, we're going to get all kinds of recommendations from folks at our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. It's an edgy topic. It just is. (laughs) It is. So whether you have an edging recommendation to make to us or you just want to commiserate and you also <laughs> find yourself struggling with the edging issue, Gardening Simplified on air.com. So uh, we're going to put a plant on trial. Of course, it is a plant that is suitable for edging. And that plant is Gem Box Inkberry Holly. You know this one? I had an inkling you were going to say that. <laughs> I bet you were working on that for a couple hours A couple now. hours at least. <laughs> <laughs> so I think a lot of people, when they hear holly, you know, their mind immediately goes to like the Christmas holly with the you yeah. know, kind of pointy, you know, shiny green leaves, pointy red berries. Gembox inkberry holly is not that. It's an inkberry holly. This is our native holly. It's, it's native to a, a large part of North America. And um, it grows, it's a semi evergreen. So when you sometimes hear that term tossed around quite a bit without people explaining what it is, but when something is semi evergreen, that basically means that it keeps the leaves at the tips of its branches and loses its inner leaves during winter. So it keeps some leaves, but not all the leaves. That is a semi evergreen. So Gembox Inkberry Holly is a semi evergreen native holly. And this particular variety grows naturally in a kind of dense, rounded shape. And one of the reasons that we selected Gembox and one of the reasons that we offer it and it has become a very uh, widespread favorite for gardeners and landscapers is because you can use it very similar to a boxwood. Okay. And it, there are some differences, which I'll get into. Um, but overall, the look and feel uh, in the garden is very similar to boxwood. But a couple of advantages, it doesn't have the disease issues that boxwood has, and it's native. And a lot of people are looking for North American natives, you know, alternative, they want to accomplish the same sort of aesthetic things that they do with non-natives, but they just want to switch it over to a native variety. And Gembox Inkberry Holly is a great choice for that. Well, I think that's important to point out, Stacy, because with Gembox, uh, when I think about inkberry in general, the native plant, I think of kind of a rangy plant with bare branches at the bottom and, and gem box is certainly not that way. Right. We spe- we specifically selected it uh, to branch and leaf out from top to bottom. Okay. Now, if they are planted too close together, you might notice a little bit of, you know, leaf drop where those things are closely spaced. So this is one that you want to give it a little bit of space to, but it is also very common for, you know, you to see a plant in the wild and then have it look totally different at home. You know, when you actually have it in your landscape, just having that kind of care, not having all of those struggles and competition that it might have out in nature, it does actually change the way the plant kind of behaves and performs in your landscape. So a couple of other things to know, if, if your interest is piqued by using Gembox as a boxwood substitute, it is not as deer resistant as boxwood. Oh, It has some deer resistance, Okay, um, but you know, of course, boxwood is virtually deer proof. You know, they really, it's one of those plants that they truly don't 
eat unless things are really, really, <laughs> really difficult. Um, so in that regard, you know, a lot of people, fortunately, don't have a deer issue. But Gembox, it is one to consider some some browsing, not super bad, but um, and it will generally recover. And it's also not as shade tolerant as boxwood. And that might be a good thing for some people. It doesn't necessarily need full sun, but it, in the deep shade, like where you could grow a boxwood and it would still look really nice, Gembox is going to get a little bit more sparse, a little bit kind of spread out. And um, it does flower and get berries because I know when, again, when people think of holly, that's what they're thinking is, is what's the berry situation. Um, and with a name like Inkberry, what color do you suppose those berries are? Well, I'm going to guess a very dark purplish black color for Inkberry. You know, I think about the 18th century or the Civil War when they would use berries like inkberry being native to, it's native to the East Coast of the U.S., isn't it? Yeah, or? so it's native basically from Maine uh, over to Pennsylvania okay. and then all the way uh, west to about Texas, but okay. it kind of skips the whole Midwest. So like Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, Minnesota, we don't really have it. So it kind of like makes a, a line, a, a diagonal line from the East Coast down to Texas. So it would make sense that Civil War soldiers used it. And that just blows me away, making an inkberry concoction. And then you got to find a bird who's willing to share a quill with you. Uh, and then you got to find paper or make paper. And then you got to somehow, you know, today we just quickly shoot off a text. Unreal. Right. And I just carrying this pen right here. Yeah. yeah Makes it a lot pen. simpler. Where's my pen? There's my pen. <laughs> but if the ink part of Inkberry is intriguing to you, um, you can certainly learn how to make ink as yeah. they did in the Civil War. And it truly was used as ink. Now, the trick is, as many people also know about holly, is you need a male and a female holly, Inkberry holly, to be able to get berries. And so both plants need to be the same species. So you can't have like... A male blue holly, the kind that gets, you know, that the females would get the red berries and use that to pollinate your inkberry holly. It needs to be another inkberry holly. And Gembox and uh, a similar plant that we offer called Strongbox are both females. Okay. Um, and up until we introduced a variety called Squeezebox last year, there were actually no, ma no known male mm. inkberry hollies on the market. Okay. So it's kind of a problem because people would say, oh, well, can I plant... Can I plant Strongbox? Can I plant, you know, Shamrock or one of these other uh, Inkberry Hollies that have been on the market for quite some time? And all of those are female. So um, we did introduce Squeezebox. Now, also, if you live in an area, of course, where Inkberry Holly is native and you're near enough to natural areas where it's growing wild, you would probably have pollination from those native okay. uh, colonies. But um, if you want it in your yard, you are going to need to plant a male. And right now, the only available male is a variety called Squeezebox. It's a little bit different. It's going to be taller. And of course, like other hollies, only the females will actually bear those ink berries. The male's just there for the pollen. So to provide a education for our viewers and our listeners, in other words, Stacy, we would say that inkberry is dioecious. In other words, female parts on one plant, male parts on a different plant. That's correct. And in this situation, we need squeeze box to make that happen. That is correct. Got it. <laughs> squeeze box is a taller, more upright plant, but uh, it doesn't have to be right next to the gem box. You can put it in another area as long as they're within about... 50 feet of each other. Okay. Um, that's You don't have to get out the measuring tape or anything like that. But that is generally the distance that you can expect insects to fly in a foraging trip to actually you know, get that pollination happening. So you're recommending this plant as a good edging plant? As a good edging plant, yes. Yeah. So okay. um, it can make kind of like a low hedge. You can just kind of plant it along, along that front edge. And what I really like about it as an edging plant is it is just, it's very pretty when it's in flower with the white flowers. But even when it's not in flower, it's just a just a nice looking little plant. It's green it's and tidy. And I like that because especially a lot of people um, want to sort of play it more safe in their landscaping. You know, they feel like, oh, I don't really know how to match the color of my home or I don't want to clash or I just want something that, that's just going to be simple and low maintenance. And this is a really great choice. And once you have that edging established of this very kind of um, subdued looking plant, then you can get away with, a, like I was saying, a lot more wild stuff inside. You sure. can get get a little bit crazy with your specimen plants or your <laughs> uh, other things that you want to do, annuals, you know, whatever. So it's a really nice choice. It's versatile. I mean, it works great in containers. You, it's not only suited to edging. But I do think it is a yeah, very, very nice choice for 
edging. So I think I kind of covered just about everything about it. Uh, and I, you know, you want to get crazy, then yeah, plant a squeeze box. And then at night after work, crush some of the berries and get out a quill and... Dearest Josephine writes, <laughs> pen some letters. It's awesome. It's great. You can send your questions to the Gardening Simplified yeah, Show with your <laughs> with your ink, Berry Holly ink. So this is a plant that is going to want moisture soil. It is not drought tolerant. Okay. Um, it is native to wet woods and kind of boggy areas. And that's going to tell you that it's just not going to do well. Um, I can tell you I have tried to grow it in my very sandy soil. <laughs> it did not go well. So definitely one that's better suited for those of you with some, you know, clay soil or irrigation and in terms of hardiness hardy down to usda zone five heat tolerant up to usda zone nine which makes sense with its being native to texas and louisiana and some of those southern states excellent sold so, all right i love it so a lot of you can grow it if you want to learn more just visit gardening simplified on air.com you can read the show notes and learn all about gem box ink berry holly we've got to take a little break when we come back we're answering your garden questions so please stay tuned Greetings, gardeners, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's my favorite time of the show because I love helping people with their gardening questions. Me too. So it works. It works great. Uh, although sometimes, you know, I don't have all the answers. A lot of people think that I do have all the answers. I do not. Plants continue to surprise me. And our first question in today's mailbag is one that I do not have the answer to, but I do know someone who does. Good. And the question comes to us from Sarah. And she says, I created a garden bed along my fence line that is also along a public sidewalk. The garden's a few feet from the sidewalk with landscaping rocks separating the two. I consistently have dog walkers allowing their dogs to pee in my garden and kill my plants. I have just recently considered scat mats or putting out a sign. I think a sign could be obnoxious and spark more of a problem. Any thoughts? Now, I know you have cats. I have no pets. But we do have a resident dog expert in the studio, Adriana Robinson, our producer. So I said, hey, Adriana, can you take a stab as Love a it. dog owner and expert on answering Sarah's question? Thank you, Stacey. That was a great lead-in, and I wish I could say I have an absolute answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, but I do have some options. I've also uh, had a couple of my plants, unfortunately, die from other dogs peeing on them. So I know how frustrating it is. But a couple of things you can try. A lot of people will put a small barrier, so like a small fence or something like that, in front of the garden. Now, Sarah, I know you said that you have a fence in back and the garden bed is actually in front of your fence. So it might look a little weird having like dual fence there. I've heard people use chili powder or other weird smells and stuff like that to kind of deter a dog. I've never personally done that. Uh, and it seems kind of cumbersome to have to season my garden consistently. <laughs> so I wouldn't personally do that. That's rough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I was waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> mm. um, yeah. So then signs are an option. I know there are some like cheeky ones that kind of make it a little more lighthearted and people might not take it so offensively. I know some dog owners do have mixed feelings about the signs, uh, but the best solution I think if you're able to do it is I have a neighbor who actually put a designated P zone sign Oh, or they put like a little fake fire hydrant, you know, to kind of show the dog or the dog and the <laughs> dog owner that like, hey, it's OK to go to the bathroom over here, but maybe, you know, keep it farther away from the garden. And I like that solution, too, because dogs are more likely to keep peeing and marking in areas that other dogs have mm. peed and marked already. Uh, if you can't beat them, join them type yeah. of approach. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> if a dog's got to go, a dog's got to go. And Yeah, yeah. no, you know, for sure. So if you can compromise and kind of have that, like a designated pee zone, I think that would be the best solution. I think that's an excellent solution, Adriana. Uh -huh. uh, it, it, what you're advising Sarah to do is renegotiate the terms of their leash. <laughs> And it works for me. <laughs> that's, exactly. that's a very good way to put it. Yeah, you don't want to have any bones to pick with your neighbors. And, you know, for the record, when I asked Adriana if she would answer this question on air, she did write me back, fur, F-U-R, sure. Oh, I love it, Adriana. <laughs> You're the best. You're the best. All right. Thanks, Adriana. Leah writes to us, I'm in Zone 5B, Nebraska. Love your show. I have two summerific evening rows, perennial hibiscus, that I'd like to transplant to a new location in my garden because the color will look better elsewhere. Two years old, still fairly small since I started with quart size containers. My question is, can I transplant them in the fall or would it be uh, better to wait until spring? 
So, uh, Leah, you are talking my language because I am just crazy about the summerific perennial hibiscus. I have, oh my gosh, I don't even know if I can count how many, probably 12 or 15 in my garden right now. They're looking amazing. I have some horrific evening rose. It's one of the newer varieties. It is absolutely gorgeous. I know you're not asking for my opinion, but I can't help but give it because I love these plants so much. Um, But having loved these plants and had them in my garden, even from when I moved from one house to another, I can tell you that uh, overall perennial hibiscus are a very durable plant when it comes to moving them. They have huge um, kind of almost they're not actually tubers, but they almost have like a tuberous type feeling. The root system does. Um, I have moved them in the middle of summer, not because that was the best thing to do, but because that's when I was moving um, and they were fine. I've moved them in early spring while they were still dormant and I've moved them in fall and every single time, you know, they were fine. I would suggest though that you do plan to do this this autumn. And the reason I'm suggesting that is because um when spring comes, it's very hard to tell what the actual perimeter of your uh, perennial hibiscus is because they stay dormant for so long. So you really don't have that sense of how much you need to dig Mm -hmm. around where the plant is. Whereas if you're doing it in fall before it goes dormant, you're really going to have, you know, that, that firsthand look at how big the plant is, where that growth is coming from, and then be able to dig accordingly. So it should be easier. You won't have to worry about setting back the plant, especially if they are so young. I have certainly dug and moved more mature ones. Um, But it should be a pretty straightforward process. And as always, I think when we've talked about transplanting before, I always recommend that as much as you can, you get the new hole prepared before you dig the plant and it's from its current hole. So you're recommending cut it back and she could pick either fall or spring. Fall or spring is fine, but I think fall has an advantage here so you can really get the sense of how big that plant is and where you should be digging because uh, the root systems are very large and it is very easy to inadvertently slice through those big oh. fleshy roots, uh, which generally won't hurt the plant too much, but it will set it back a bit. So it's just kind of one of those best practices things. Well, Leah gave us a bonus with her question. She added a limerick that details her dilemma. She says, in my mind, I've got a great vision. I think I plant with precision, but perfection I'm seeking. So I'm always tweaking. Please help me make a decision. Outstanding, Leah. So here's my answer for you. Summerific provides great coloring to your landscape. Add some zing. Hi there, Leah. I've got an idea. Let's move that plant next spring. So, <laughs> oh, that's anyway. good too. So fall or spring? <laughs> fall or spring. Whatever. Okay. You know, we garden in the real world. So whatever yeah. works for you, that's just my uh, two cents as a fellow Summerific fan. So Stacy, uh, a question here from Kaliza who says, hi, Stacy and Rick, love watching and listening to you both. I was wondering if there is a climbing hydrangea or a climbing vine that you would suggest I'm in zone 6B, looking for a plant for full sun and one for partial sun and shade. Yes, and then we had a second one from Kathy who had a very similar question. She was listening to you uh, when we talked about Sweet Summer Love last week, and she wants to grow vines on some dead spruce trees. She wants to leave the dead spruce trees for the birds, I which is idea. very, very a great thing that you can do for birds. Um, but she wants to cover them in vines so it doesn't just look like you know a tree cemetery. <laughs> uh, totally get it. I'm on your side. I love that idea, Kathy. Um, so I did a quick little list here of some interesting woody vines that uh, Kathy and Kaliza or Kaliza. Sorry, I don't hope. We're pronouncing your name. One of those two is probably right. Uh, So one of my favorites. Now, we talked last week or a week or two ago about trumpet vine and how it's beautiful and attracts hummingbirds, but it's just a little bit too vigorous for a lot of residential situations. Not necessarily going to make good neighbors. So I have an alternative, and it's bignonia. Do you know this? It's also called cross vine. No, I'm not familiar with it. So it's a a close relative of campsus or trumpet vine, Uh, but it's... Now, in warmer climates, it is pretty much equally as vigorous. But in cooler climates like ours, it is much more restrained. And it gets, I actually like the flowers even better than trumpet vine. What'd you call that? Uh, Bignonia, B-I-G-N-O-N-I-A. Some people call it cross vine. Okay. Um, It is an evergreen vine. So sometimes here in West Michigan, the foliage does not come out of winter looking its best, but it recovers very quickly. Um, and that's, like I said, a really good one. It's not going to be as aggressive as, as trumpet vine, but it's going to do a lot of the same good things. 
Um, Hardy Aristolochia, Dutchman's Pipe. You know this plant? Yes. Considered an oh, yeah. old-fashioned plant, but yep. a very cool plant. Mm-hmm. Uh, attracts a ton of pollinators. As a, it's a good larval host for a lot of different um, butterfly species. Decumaria, which is a, yes, this, Adriana just gave me a look. Uh, not a very popular plant. It is out there, but it is actually sort of, you could think of it as the American climbing hydrangea. Deku Maria sounds yes. like a board game you break out on Saturday night. <laughs> Maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> um, so it's not as showy as a climbing hydrangea, but it is a, it's a really beautiful choice uh, for um, just adding some kind of naturalistic look. And it has a common name. Now, you know, I, I generally prefer to use scientific names, but a common name for Deku Maria, I love this name so much, Wood Vamp. All one word. <laughs> so uh, you'll find that again, specialty nurseries, but it is out there. Vining honeysuckles. Yes. Uh, you know, people uh, a lot of times will think honeysuckle and think, whoa, 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 that's super invasive. It's really only the shrub honeysuckles that are invasive. The vining honeysuckles generally are not an issue. And we even actually have some native uh, vining honeysuckles in the U.S. They tend not to be as showy as the ones you're going to find in garden centers like Major Wheeler and, and that kind of thing. You have one called Sensation, right? Yes. Am I wrong yep. about that? No, you're correct. Okay. Yeah, that's an all yellow one. So another great choice. We have native passion flowers. So if you're in like zone six or warmer, oh, yeah. those also make an oh, excellent yeah. choice. Another great way to support pollinators. I have a couple more choices, but we've got to take a little break. So be sure you visit the show notes at gardening simplified on air.com and you'll find all of our suggestions questions there and that's where you'll also go if you have a question that you'd like us to answer on a future show we're going to take a break when we come back we got branching news so please stay tuned welcome back to the gardening simplified show it's time for branching news not breaking news but we don't make this stuff up hey stacy right off the bat just want to mention you know we've all watched uh, the tragedy in hawaii and what has occurred over the past couple weeks And uh, there was a headline that caught my eye about a banyan tree in Maui, uh, Lahaina. And it's a 150-year-old tree that they're trying to save. And the arborists used a terminology that they're trying to save this tree, adding compost, soil aeration, a daily watering program, uh, because they stated that the tree is in a coma. Hmm. I had not heard that term no, I haven't used either. before, and uh, that was the headline. So they're trying to bring back this tree uh, primarily because uh, it just means so much to the people in the area. Uh, it's one of those specimen trees, 150 years old, huge banyan tree. Uh, and we're hoping that these arborists are successful in doing that. Okay, on a lighter note, uh, also in the news... Visitors to sunflower fields are urged to stop posing naked for photos. <laughs> There's a farm in uh, Great Britain that has gotten on Facebook, social media, put up signs because they're having all kinds of problems with people who go to their farm, their sunflower farm, take off their clothes for pictures. And, of course, there's there's kids around also. These are public sessions. They grow... Uh, Wheat, peas, potatoes, pumpkin, squash, sweet corn, hay, and sunflowers. And people are taking off their clothes to take pictures. And they're not artfully placing the sunflowers <laughs> while they're doing this. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah, it's not bouquet to do that, okay? <laughs> it's not. I mean, these people want to photosynthesize with their selfies. Well, go ahead, but not in a field where there's kids around. So stop it. Maybe they just need like a special, like, you know, hour that's dedicated to these people. (laughs) The Stoke Fruit Farm (laughs) on Hailing Island. Yes, after dark. Well, that's not going to work either. So whatever. Anyhow, now this has tremendous interest to me because I love monarch butterflies I enjoy running, and a Montreal runner is following a 4,500-kilometer monarch butterfly migration path to Mexico. Anthony Bata says he hopes to inspire others to take action to protect the species. So he is running from, uh, from Canada, Montreal's Insectarium. I believe I pronounced that right. Uh, and he has finished the Canadian stretch of his run. 
He's hoping to finish. Uh, he just crossed the Ambassador Bridge from Windsor, Ontario, into Detroit, and uh, is going to continue on into central Mexico to follow the path that monarch butterflies take and um, uh, to call attention to the fact that uh, we need to be thinking about our monarch butterflies. Pretty cool thing. That's very cool. You should do the same thing. You got a couple thousand mile oh. head start on Anthony. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's true. <laughs> He's still going to beat me. I can guarantee you that. But uh, what a what a great way yeah, to really uh, cool. to call attention to it. It's not a it's not a running joke. This is a true story. Okay, Anthony is uh, making that run. So we're going to follow his progress. We'll post the story at Gardening Simplified on Air uh, dot com. In school, he was good at jog geography. Forget <laughs> it. Bad pun. You know what I was trying to say. Uh, okay. And then back to goats. Last week we talked about goats. They goats continue to be in the news. Roy's goats, a mass, uh, Mitzi Roy's goats, a Massachusetts business using them for weed control, got the idea to add yoga to her mm -hmm. herds business when she picked up spent beer grains at a local brewery for the goats to eat. People have asked her about using the animals to participate in yoga classes and it's become a very, very popular activity. Yes, goat yoga is is the thing to do. I have not yet done it, okay. but there are goat yoga places even here in Michigan, if if we have any interested listeners. Wow, I'd like to try it sometime. I okay. I have tried. I, I'll admit, I have tried yoga. I tend to be a little disruptive in class, telling jokes and that kind of thing. So <laughs> I have to straighten myself out. But I, I'd like to do it. And uh, yoga with goats, that sounds like fun to me. That would be, yes, that would be distracting, but in a delightful way. Okay. So I'll share my joke with the, uh, the listeners and the viewers this week. You guys have already heard this one. But the goats, when they get done with uh, their weeding and then they get done with yoga class, go home to rest, watch some TV, and generally they watch The Bachelor or America's Goat Talent or Grey's Anatomy. There you go. I know. I had to squeeze those in there. I just wanted to. Okay, and then uh, let's take a look at this. Oh, this is interesting. In a neighborhood. So last week we talked about neighborhood gardening. In a neighborhood, there are frustrated homeowners who are attempting to solve a community-wide issue. I guess there's a neighbor who has a very large pool that's not being maintained properly. It's just sitting there. So it's become a mosquito Oof. breeding ground. So neighbors are resorting to BT dunks. Now, Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT, is a naturally occurring soil-borne bacteria. It's been used since the 1950s for natural insect control. And I was just looking at this thread, and it's so funny because neighbors are saying, don't ask for permission. Don't ask for permission. Don't say anything. They're simply taking these mosquito dump dunks, and they lob them over the fence like grenades. Well, who could the blame them? I mean, mosquitoes are very serious business. You oh, they're serious. Business. You can't invite them in with a massive pool. Nobody likes mosquitoes, not even bats. If I was in that neighborhood, I'd be all over it, you know, putting the face paint on and cam camouflage at night and lobbing those mosquito dunks into the pool. That would be fun. Well, you know, I have seen them before and they are fortunately quite easy to lob, I'm sure. <laughs> if you, you know, if you got a good arm. Yeah, I guess so. Get so. some little leaguers in there to practice their uh, their pitching. More neighborly uh, gardening. Uh, for that neighborhood, it's time to bring in the SWAT team. <laughs> and I'd be all over that. Walkie-talkies, the whole bit. Okay. You're wearing black today. Is that for a reason? <laughs> yeah, tonight I'm on Mosquito Patrol. <laughs> okay, and then a final story in branching news today. Stinky the Owl. He's a great horned owl that was rescued from a manure pit and is now recovering at the Raven Ridge Wildlife Center in Lancaster County. Now, I bring this up because you and I and Adriana, we love birds. We enjoy birds. So I always look for a bird story. Many of our listeners and viewers love birds, too. And I love Stinky the Owl. Uh, he fell into a manure pit. That would smell foul. I can tell you that. A state game warden brought the bird in on July 18 after it had been stuck in the manure pit for two days. Oh, poor thing. I know. It broke my heart, especially if you see the picture. 
And we're going to put the link there at the website because someone had also shot it in the eye with a BB. Oh, gosh, yes. no. That's terrible. And it's stuck in a manure pit. So um, I'm this state game warden. Way to go. Way to go. Brought the bird in. And Stinky is recovering, has a red injured eye and was in that manure pit. They've removed the BB and they say that uh, the great horned owl is uh, is going to be okay. And whoever shot it, of course, it's, it's a federal offense. I call it a federal offense, but it's a federal offense. And uh, so this, uh, everybody's rooting for Stinky. He's expected to be released by the fall. Well, I hope that that state trooper got the hot shower he deserved exactly. after rescuing poor Stinky the owl. <laughs> and Stinky, <laughs> thank didn't you want, for doing that. That's right. And Stinky didn't want to be owl by himself. All right, that's it for branching news this week. Fun show. I'm going to go home and do some edging. Okay, that's good because you know otherwise I was afraid you're going to go sneak around and throw something <laughs> in your neighbor's yard. <laughs> I might do that too. Thanks for watching the Gardening Simplified Show. Stacy, thanks so much. And Adriana Robinson, thank you for all you do. Thanks most of all to you, our listeners and our viewers. Make sure to go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Have yourself a great week.